All right, as the kids are heading out, I do want to encourage you to open your Bibles to Mark 14 this morning. Mark 14, and we'll begin our reading in verse 12 in just a moment. Mark 14, uh, verses 12 to 25, as we'll read here in just a moment. And as we read this passage of sacred scripture, we're going to recognize that this is known as the Last Supper. And uh, if you have the picture of Da Vinci's Last Supper in your mind, you can rest assured that is certainly not what it would have looked like. Um, Sorry to, to ruin your life with that tidbit. Um, but nonetheless, this, this was a highly significant day that the Jewish people met together to observe the Passover, and Jesus made it even more significant in turning uh, that special aspect and really instituting the Lord's Supper. So if you will, verse number 12 is where we'll begin. And if you remember last week, we ended in verses 10 and 11 where Judas has now devised a plot that he will betray Jesus when he gets the opportunity to do so. Verse 12, And on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, Where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. Uh, There prepare for us. Verse 16, And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at table and entering, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him, One after another, is it I? And he said to them, It is one one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing, he broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks... He gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. This ends the reading of God's holy and inerrant and infallible word this morning. For just a few moments as we go through this passage of Scripture, I want to talk to you about the meals at the Last Supper. The meals at the Last Supper. Well, today is Mother's Day, and men, if you're just finding that out, sorry, this is your funeral. Um, But mothers, we do want to say thank you for all that you do for us, and uh, I hope that your kids will take you out somewhere nice and uh, do something for you today. And certainly, you know, I think of my own mom when I think of days like this. And one of my fondest memories of my mom growing up is her cooking. I don't remember my mom fixing a lot of bad dishes. I mean, we would eat barbecue chicken, pot roast, pork chops, just about everything you can imagine. And as any good southern mom, we always had southern vegetables, right? And I even called her the other day to ask her about her cube steak, and it turned out pretty good, if I must say so myself. But meals, when I was a kid, was kind of a necessary evil. And what I mean by that was I was more interested in eating so I could go out and play than I was having a conversation with my mom and dad about the things of the day. You understand what I'm saying? You, you feel that? As you get older, your perspective changes on stuff like that, though, doesn't it? You think more about how 
important it is as an adult to enjoy conversation and just to sit with your family and enjoy being with them for just a few moments. And unfortunately, we are in a day and age in which family dinners are pretty much a thing of the past. And I think we, as much as possible, need to retrieve those types of things. In our family, we don't eat at the table every single solitary meal. But man, when we miss it, we miss it. And when you get back to it, it's something you realize that you need to do on a regular basis. As we go through the Bible, eating meals was a very significant thing. It's it's much more significant than going to McDonald's to wolf down a double cheeseburger, all right? According to the one Bible dictionary that I read, as you go throughout the Scriptures, you're going to find eating meals being significant in demonstrating hospitality, Uh, It's also an affirmation of kinship or goodwill. It's an acknowledgement of one's status that they're wealthy or that they're poor on the other side. Or it is a peaceful disposition to people and a commitment to nonviolence. Meals in Scripture were to demonstrate fellowship. And ultimately, the commemorative meals, like we're going to talk about in just a moment, like Passover, was meant for people to slow down. It was meant for them to stop and to come together and remember the goodness of God in their lives and in in their nation collectively. And I think one of the reasons that we struggle in understanding the Lord's Supper as we ought is because we don't have those seasons of rest anymore. We are so busy that some of us have even lost the desire to slow down. We seek to pack every moment of life with with things that we can do. And we can rest assured that in such times, our devotion to family and even to Christ is going to slip. In our text this morning, all but two or three verses mention food, drink, preparation for meals, or partaking of meals. The meal that is mentioned here, as I've already said, is the Last Supper. And you may not have realized this before, but at the Last Supper, there are actually two suppers, two dinners that are being celebrated. The first is the Passover, which was the Jewish celebration of being liberated from Egyptian bondage. And at that dinner, they would have roasted lamb and unleavened bread, bitter herbs, vegetables, and a fruit mixture that was used to provide uh, a place to dip bread. And also, wine would be uh, mixed with water. The second dinner that we're going to be looking at, of course, is the Lord's Supper. And this is uh, the elements that are there, the bread and watered-down wine. But as you look through these two, we're not going to be focusing necessarily on what they ate. We're not going to be focusing on the cuisine and how they fixed roasted lamb and that type of thing. But what we're going to be focusing on is the symbolism that we find in these two dinners. What did it mean to them? What does it mean to us? How do we apply these things to our lives? The one thing that you're going to note as we go through this section, the one thing that really ties these passages together is the emphasis that God places on fellowship with Him and fellowship with his people. That was at the heart of meals in the Bible. Fellowship with God and fellowship with his people. So as we go through this text, we're going to look at those two meals. We're going to look at, number one, Passover, and number two, we're going to look at the Lord's Supper. So let's look at the first one, which is Passover. So as we go through the first five verses that we read, uh, verses 12 to 16... Uh, This is really, letter A, preparation for the Passover. And if these verses are anything to us, they're more background material. You know what I mean when I say that? It's just kind of providing the backdrop of what Mark wants to tell us about this dinner. There is one thing that I think is really significant that we're going to try to drive home here in just a minute. But as we go through these verses, it's, it's interesting that in verse 12, the disciples come to Jesus And they say to him, tell us where you want to take the Passover. They don't say to him, where do we take the Passover? But they say, where do you want to take the Passover? And Jesus gives them a sign. And he says, there's going to be a man that you're going to see as you go into town. And he's going to be carrying a jug of water. Now, this would have been uncommon in that day because in that day, women were the ones who were... Uh, carrying water, just like the woman at the well. That was the job of women, to go and to 
get water for the family. And once they identified this man as carrying the water, they were to follow him. And they were to go to him and speak to the owner of the house and ask him about the quarters that they needed to partake of the Passover that night. Now, there's, there's a debate that's going on and has been, I guess, for centuries in uh, verses 12 to 16 as to whether or not Jesus is using divine omniscience here. And what I mean by omniscience is just God knowing all things. And the Bible does tell us very clearly over and over again that God possesses all knowledge. There is nothing that we do that is beyond his understanding. He knows not only what we have done, but why we do it, even how many hairs we have on our head or lack thereof, right? But the text does not tell us specifically that Jesus is tapping into divine omniscience here. And I think the better way to understand the text, the more natural way to understand the text, is that Jesus has set a plan. And the reason that he has set this plan, obviously, is because he doesn't want Judas to find out before he needs to. He says in somewhat secrecy to his two most trusted disciples that we find in Luke that it is Peter and John, go and find us a place to commemorate the Passover. Why doesn't he give that job to the other ten? Because he doesn't want Judas to know it. Because Judas has already made a plan in verses 10 and 11, and Jesus knows that ultimately Judas is going to betray him when he gets the right moment. And if he would have told them beforehand, they went to the upper room, the guards of the Sanhedrin would have been waiting on him. And Jesus has some lessons that he needs to teach his disciples here at this Last Supper with the backdrop of the Passover. Jesus is living the principle out here that he taught his disciples, which is that we are to be as wise as serpents and harmless as doves. Now, what do we find taking place here? The two trusted disciples go into town. They find the guy carrying water. They go to the house. They talk to the owner. And the owner says, hey, here we go. Well, you can have the Passover dinner here. Is there anything significant in these verses? There's one thing I want to highlight in verse 14 that I think is really significant. For context's sake, look at verse 13 as well. It says this, And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jug of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, The teacher says... Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? Notice that last phrase in verse 14. Where I may eat the Passover with my disciples. Now stick with me for just a second. But when we're communicating in language, we have certain ways that we try to do that, right? In English, the normal way of our sentence structure is subject, verb, direct object, right? Does anybody remember that from school or... You, you forgot that. Yeah, some of you are looking at me like, what's English, right? Um, but yeah, it, when, you're in, when you're in school, you learn that it's subject, verb, direct object. So if I was going to describe my exercise habits, I would say, I walk outside. Unless I was like three years old, and I'd say, you know, outside me walk or something like that, right? What's the point? In Greek, the normal sentence structure is verb, subject, direct object. So if you wanted to emphasize something in a sentence in Greek, you put it in front of the verb. What's in front of the verb here? In verse 14, it's actually the phrase that you find at the end of verse 14. The emphatic phrase that we find here is where with my disciples. The emphasis that Jesus is making here is that he desperately desires to have the Passover with disciples. His people. Again, interesting. Verse 12, the disciples said, where do you want to go? And then he looks at them and says, where are we going to go? I want to be there with you. And another interesting phrase here. The phrase, my disciples. Jesus only uses that phrase one time in the Greek New Testament of his 12 disciples. You'd think it'd be more than that. So the only time that the Gospels record Jesus as referring to the twelve and speaking of them as my disciples is right here. 
And I think it's extremely interesting. What does all of that mean? Why is it here? Why now? Why is this so significant? Well, I think the text, again, is highlighting the fact that Jesus desperately wants to observe the Last Supper with his disciples. You see, the Passover was a family meal. According to the Old Testament, it was something that the head of the household was to do. And he was to instruct his family in what Passover meant as they went through that ritual dinner. And you could only have it with your intimate family or with a neighbor. Or it had to be somebody that was a recipient of the old covenant. And now Jesus here desires to have this meal with his people for reflection and instruction. As Christ desired to spend time with them, I want you to understand something. Christ desires to spend time with us. As he desperately desires and emphasizes the fact, I want to be with the twelve right now. The Bible tells us he desires to spend time with us as well. When I was a kid, Revelation 3.20 was a verse that was quoted often. And if you're familiar with that verse, you know it's about Jesus knocking on a door and and desiring to come in and sup with someone. There's even a famous picture about it. The verse says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock, and if anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in to him and eat with him, and he with me. I always heard that verse interpreted as Jesus is knocking on the door of every sinner's heart. And if they will just simply open the door, Jesus will come in and he will forgive them of their sins and wash them white. But really the verse is talking about Christ desiring to fellowship with his people. It's in the context of the the most carnal church in in all of uh, that, that section in Revelation, the church at Laodicea. They were lukewarm. And Jesus is knocking on the door saying, I want to come in. I want to have supper with you. I want to fellowship with you. But you got to open the door. Friends, life is not meant to be lived at 120 miles an hour every moment. We need moments of rest. There are times in life when we need to slow down and reflect on the goodness of God. And there is a definite emphasis as you go throughout the Gospel of Mark on the importance of rest. Now, when it comes to rest, it's not necessarily the way we think about it. We think about rest as, whew, I got Saturday off. We're going to the beach in two weeks. Please, nobody died. Let's just make an agreement now that nobody will die over the next two weeks, okay? That was supposed to be funny. I guess it wasn't, all right? But reality is um, we're going away and we're looking forward to it. But the emphasis in Mark on rest is always on spending time with Jesus. I recently said in a Bible study about how we're too busy nowadays. You know, um, whenever we say the phrase, are you staying busy, which I'm trying to purge it from my vocabulary. Because really what you're saying when you say that is, I don't know what to say to you next. Because I haven't heard anybody lately say that they're not busy, right? Everybody's got so much going on, and we've got more stuff than we have time for. Look, through our lives, our problems and our schedules are going to change, but our needs never change. When you get older, your your problems are going to change in different ways. Your schedule is going to look differently but your need of Christ is never going to change. As a young adult, we're tempted to be wrapped up in ourselves doing what we want to do. All the while, the invitation of Christ is there to come in and sup with Him. And oftentimes we deny because we say, I've got my thing to do. When we get a little older... We get wrapped up in in just scraping out a living and all the things that come with that. And we say to Jesus, I just don't have time right now. Or maybe you're even older than that and now you have more time and you sit in loneliness and depression. Friend, at the end of the day, our busy world needs to slow down. We need to take a step back and we need to spend time fellowshipping with Christ. We need to spend time reading His Word. We need to spend time with Him in prayer. And I find out that when I am the busiest, when I'm bogged down with the pressures of life, 
I'm tempted to neglect my time with Christ more than anything else. And as a pastor, as a husband, as a father, I tend to go through the motions and become nothing more than a play actor. And maybe right now your Christian life feels hollow. It feels stilted. But friend, the good news that we have today is if you know Christ, He's still knocking on the heart door. He's still desiring to spend time with you. And He's still desiring for you to stop and remember His goodness and grace and love to you. Today is a new day and all you have to do is open the door and He will come in and His word will resonate with you. Now notice letter B. We see the preparation of the Passover, which is really, I think, kind of the theme of what's going on, is that Jesus is desiring to spend time with his disciples. Letter B now, in verses 17 to 21, is the prediction at the Passover. Uh, Mark is not really interested in these verses and giving us details that we're already familiar with, or people of his day were already familiar with. According to the MacArthur Study Bible, Uh, There were seven different sequences that took place in a traditional Passover. They would eat at certain times. They would drink wine. They would eat more. And at one point, the head of the the ceremony would describe the Passover. And no doubt, that, that responsibility here fell to Jesus. But according to Mark, he gives us two details about what took place on that supper that was different than all other Passover dinners. It is, number one, the betrayal of Judas, and secondly, the institution of the Lord's Supper. Look at verses 17 and 18. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve, and as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. This news would have hit them like a, literally a bombshell. As they are sitting there, enjoying this high holy feast. Nobody expected that Jesus was going to say this next. And one thing we've noted as we've gone throughout the Gospels is just how bad the disciples were, right? I mean, these were not the, the stained glass saints that we see them as today. The Gospels present them as being proud and jealous and self centered However, one positive thing we see about the disciples over and over in the Gospels was their loyalty to Christ. That's why this took them by such surprise. In John 6, 66, when Jesus said some offensive statements and many people who were following after him walked away, Jesus looks at his disciples and says, Are you going to go away as well? And Peter steps up and says for the group, Where else can we go? You have the words of eternal life. None of them had any idea that this was coming. None of them even thought it remotely possible that one of them could betray Jesus like he just predicted. This was a close-knit group. It all left everything. And I think it also is interesting that here in this text, they don't look at Judas and say, We've been wondering about you, dude. We knew it was you all along. No, they didn't do that. You know why? Because they were close friends of Judas. Judas had done miracles just like they had done. Let that sink in for a second. Judas had preached Christ-centered sermons just like they did. Judas had evangelized just like they did. Judas had served Christ just like they did. And friend, you and I need to remember and understand that the assurance of your salvation is not in your service or your ability to do things for God. Your assurance of salvation is not in your experience. Many people are clinging to visions and experiences and emotional feelings of ecstasy and thinking that that is the basis upon which they are accepted by God. And yet the assurance that we have that we belong to Christ is that we hear His voice, that we are not in an audible sense, but we're we're desiring to obey Him, we're desiring to honor Him, we're becoming closer to Him throughout our lives, and we do not forsake Him. Now notice how they respond in verse 19. Verse 19 says, And they began to be sorrowful and to say to one another, uh, one after another, Is it I? Is it I? 
they all around the room just begin to, like popcorn, say, hey, is it me? Is it me? Is it me? The idea in verse 19 is that the answer is to be negative here. Literally, it means, surely it's not I. And yet, how often have we seen in Scripture that overconfidence of your relationship with God and your walk with God is not good for you? How many times have we seen, even in the sports world, when teams go onto the court or the field, and everybody knows they're going to win? And they get blown away because in their minds they think there's no way we can lose. How many wars have been lost because of the arrogance and the overconfidence of the stronger faction? And how many Christians have fallen because of their overconfidence? How many Christians have fallen because they viewed themselves as ten feet tall and bulletproof? And 1 Corinthians tells us that we are to take heed lest we fall. There is no sin that is too big that any believer cannot commit. And there is no one in here today that is too holy that could not commit the worst sin possible. And while only Judas betrays Jesus, all of them would forsake him. All of them would, to an extent, deny him. And in our own church, we need to remember that the most vulnerable among us to fall are the most proud and the most isolated. Verses 20 and 21, and he said to them, it is one of the twelve, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me, for the Son of Man goes as is written of him, but woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better. For that man, if he had not been born. Let that sit in a second. As they're all going around the room saying, Jesus, surely it's not me. Peter says, how could it be me? John said, surely it's not me. And even Judas, playing the part in a cold-blooded fashion, says the same thing. And Jesus reiterates in verse 20, yes, one of you, one of you, one of the twelve, one that has been with me, you will betray me. The words of verse 21 are some of the most chilling words in all the Bible, aren't they? Can you imagine somebody saying that about you? That it had been better if you'd never been born? Maybe you're here this morning and somebody has said something like that to you. Maybe it was... Somebody in a fit of anger that was a friend of yours and they said something to you like, I wish I'd never met you. Maybe a child has turned away from you and said, my life would have been better off if I'd have had another parent. Or even maybe your parents have said something like that. But one thing we can guarantee is that God has never said that type of thing about His children. Our God in heaven loves sinners like you and I. And He delights in our salvation and He will save you from the deepest of sin if you will but repent of of your sins and turn to Him. And yet Jesus says here about this man, His sin will be so dark, so black, so ugly, so wicked that it would have been better for Him if He would have never even been conceived. The potential that a child has when they are born is great, isn't it? That's one of the reasons we get so excited about having having children. They could become a doctor and rid the world of some serious disease. They could become a real problem solver. They could minister their community and make it a better place. Or on the other side, the potential of that life that is born could completely throw their lives away. It's our greatest fear as parents, isn't it? That we wonder what what evil is out there. But we need to remember the greatest danger that our children have is not necessarily the evil out there, but it's the evil that is within them. That is born there as they're born in sin. And what we said last week is the deed of Judas and what he did is squarely placed upon his shoulders He bears the responsibility of what he did. Yes, the Bible talks about the broader plan of God. It even talks about the divine decree 
And how sin is even a part of that in the plan of God. But yet Judas cannot and will not be able to look at God on the final day and just say to him, I was just doing what you made me do. One person I read behind this past week said this about Jesus and Judas both. said, neither Jesus nor Judas is an instrument of blind fate or a pawn of divine strategy. That's right. Does Jesus speak here about the eternal consequences of Judas? Or is he talking here about his reputation? I, I, I think it could be either one, but I think the latter is what he's talking about. I think it's his reputation. I think he's talking about the, the life that he would live and that, that memory that would linger on of his betraying disposition. Nobody names their child Judas nowadays, right? I mean, that would be something you'd probably get taken to court over. Because it has such horrible connotations to it. And yet, just as Judas, we have one life to live. And just as Judas, we have choices to make and we will either honor Christ and live for Him or we will not. And friends, we can absolutely in our lives ruin our reputation and ruin our testimony to others. The reality is some of us are closer to heaven than others right now. It's just a fact. That there may be some people even sitting here now who won't be here next year. Only God knows. The only thing we do know is that your story is not completely written yet. You and I must live lives in such a way that when people hear our names after our death, they don't wince. Or even worse, somebody at our funeral says, my life would have been better if I'd have never met him or I'd have never met her. My prayer is, no matter what's happened in the past, that we will be faithful to Christ until we get to the finish line. Now, quickly as we go through the next section, the second meal that we come to in verses 22 to 25 is the Lord's Supper. So mark that down if you will. You've got Passover and then you've got the Lord's Supper. As I've already stated, the leader of the family in the Passover at one point in the dinner was, was commissioned to give the meaning behind Passover. And they were to explain what God had done in the Old Testament and how God had brought them out of Egyptian bondage. And yet here during the meal, Jesus diverts his listeners, he diverts the disciples from the Old Covenant, which was a picture of of what Christ was going to do in shadows and types and lambs that died and bulls and goats and even pictures of people like Joseph and Isaac. All of the Old Testament that's pointing up to him. Now Jesus diverts from the Old Covenant to the New. All of that that was leading up to that moment is now fulfilled in what Christ is about to do. Notice letter A, it's the symbolism of the Lord's Supper. Look at verses 22 and 24. And as they were eating, he took bread, and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is uh, my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. It's so clear that when you read these verses, Jesus is speaking in what is known as covenantal language. He even uses the word covenant in verse 24. If you are wanting to be a good Bible student, you need to be familiar with the covenants of the Bible. One person has said that the covenants of the Bible are like a spine. They provide stability and support for the rest of the body. And that is true. The covenants are a, a weighty thing in Scripture. It's kind of like a contract, but it's heavier. It has more responsibility in it. It's like when you get married. It's not a contract that you enter into with your spouse. You enter into a covenant with your spouse. It is heavier in its responsibility for, to fulfill it than it is in even signing a contract to buy a house. But when you sign a contract to buy a house or, or a business or something like that, there's a ton of legal language there, right? And the reason for that is to demonstrate that this is a binding document between two parties. And these two parties must live up to their end of the bargain. And one of the things that you see over and over and over again through the covenants 
is that most, if not all, the covenants of Scripture were sealed with blood. The Noahic covenant was sealed with the blood of an innocent animal. The Abrahamic covenant was sealed with the blood of an innocent animal. As a matter of fact, those animals were split in half and, and Abraham had planned to go through those, those animals with God and God puts a deep sleep on him and God goes through them by himself. The Mosaic covenant was sealed with blood and here we see the new covenant. The covenant That Jesus is the head of. He is sealing the new covenant with his own blood. The benefits of the covenant for those who enter into it is sealed by none the less than the blood of Christ. In just a few hours Jesus will give himself as a sacrifice on the cruel cross of Calvary. And the reason that he does this is to seal the benefits for those that are in the new covenant. You see this in Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. You see the benefits of the new covenant recipients, which, by the way, we are members of, if you know Christ. What are the benefits of being in the new covenant? It is the promise of forgiveness of sin. No matter how black, no matter how dark, no matter how rotten you look at your past and you think it's so bad, Christ's death atones for every sin that you've ever committed if you're in the new covenant. You see the promise of His Spirit. Yes, the third person of the Trinity lives within those who are recipients of the new covenant. He promises us a new heart that will love God and not be hard toward Him and despise Him, but a desire to obey. And if you are in that new covenant, understand the blood that was shed accomplished all of that for you. But on the flip side, if you are outside of it, there is no forgiveness for you. There is no remission of sin for you. The Spirit does not live within you and you do not have a desire to live for God. The great question that you have to answer as you're looking at this text is are you a member of the new covenant? The beauty of of the new covenant that is sealed with the blood of Christ is it doesn't matter who your daddy is. (laughs) And it doesn't matter who your great granddaddy is. It doesn't matter what side of the tracks you grew up on. All that matters is that you will acknowledge the Lordship of Christ and submit to Him, believe His gospel, and turn from your sins that you might be saved. And friends, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Supper that we partake of monthly here is a sign and symbol of the new covenant. Just like the rainbow in the clouds is a reminder of God's promise to Noah that he will never destroy the earth again. And just like circumcision was a promise to Abraham of his blessings toward him, the Lord's Supper is a sign and seal of the new covenant. The bread and the wine both symbolize the death of Christ on our behalf. And one of the reasons, listen, that we partake of the Lord's Supper is because we're a part of the new covenant. We take it because we're a part, not in order to become a part. It's possible here, depending on how you read the Gospels and and, and link them together, it's possible that Judas took the Lord's Supper here. Cold-blooded, lethal, holding up the bread and taking the cup to his own lips. In the midst of all of those who were truly a part of the New Covenant, acting as if he himself was one. And yet, we see very clearly that he was not a recipient of the new covenant. If he did indeed partake of the, of the cup and of the bread, it didn't make him a Christian. The reason we take uh, true believers that are to partake of the Lord's Supper is it is a reminder to all five senses. All five senses, taste, smell, hearing, touch, sight, all of it, is to remind us of what Jesus has done for us. And did you notice here that Jesus blesses the bread and give thanks to the cup, or for the cup? Paul will later pick up on this language in 1 Corinthians 10, and he will call it the cup of blessing that we come to when we partake of the Lord's Supper. It is blessed because of Christ's endorsement and His death uh, that, that would seal the new covenant. And it is there... When you partake of the Lord's Supper. 
The cup is blessed by Christ and it is a means of fellowshipping with Jesus. It's not merely sitting and thinking about Him a little bit. That's not, that's not all that the Lord's Supper does for us. It is no less than you meeting with the head of the new covenant. I read some startling words on the severity of the supper this week where one author says this, When the Lord's Supper is served at the end of a worship service, people may examine their watches more than their hearts. And they may be worried about dinner, more worried about dinner than they have how they have betrayed Jesus in the past week or how they might betray Him in the next. And he says Mark's account of the Last Supper should jolt us awake. Notice the last thing in verse 25. It's the finality. The finality. In verse 25 it says this, Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. With the supper complete, with the Passover done, the Lord's Supper instituted, Jesus says, this is the last time that I will drink any wine with you. This is the last time that we will have any kind of intimate fellowship face to face like this. Because they are going to be dealt with the tragic blow of his death that's coming in just a few hours. And they will deal ultimately throughout life with the difficulties of losing family and friends for his name's sake. But Jesus in essence says to them in that verse, remember, remember guys, in the end, no matter how much we lose here in life, we win in the end. And the reason we win in the end is because we're a part of the new covenant. Christ will die, Christ will rise, Christ will ascend, and one day Christ is coming back. And when He comes, He will institute the kingdom that He kicked off and He began on earth as He preached the gospel. Friends, one of the most important skills in life that we have to master is priorities, right? We have one life to live and we can waste it. We can squander the precious gift that God has given to us. And when I think about my mom today on Mother's Day, and some of the things she taught me, family's always been at the top of the list. And how important family is supposed to be. And she never had to sit me down and say, Now Seth, let me tell you, family should be important. She lived it. However, the greater lesson that she taught me is that God is to always be our priority. Even above family. Let us not make good or weak excuses and allow that to keep us from fellowshipping with Christ. We must develop a daily rhythm of walking with Him and talking with Him. And the reality is, if you've failed at that, even in recent days, understand Jesus is still knocking at the heart door. The Lord's Supper will be here for you the next time that we partake of it. Christian friend, take the time today to rebuild the altar of daily worship in your life and stoke that fire. And just, or if you're already there, just keep walking with Christ. Make that the priority of your life and everything else will fall in order. The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of our God endures forever. Let's pray. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let's just take a moment to pray and seek the Lord about whatever it is that He's spoken to us about today.